Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. I'm here with a few of my closest friends, plus Garrett and Sean. And you, of course. Everything on the table is for sale. Names, references, and prices in the description below. The email, tmasso at thewatchbox.com. This email for all your questions about buying the watches you see here on this channel or on our website. Let's jump straight in with something exceptional. Omega, a brand I love. It's where I started in luxury watches. And in 2018, this was probably the coolest new watch from Omega. 42 millimeters in titanium, rose gold, and blue gray tantalum. This is the Diver 300 meter limited edition, part of the Seamaster Diver 300 meter family. It features individual numbering on a bolt fixed rose gold facing plate, a lovely primarily titanium construction and a combination of satin gray titanium, blue gray tantalum, and rose gold. And you can really see that to effect on the bracelet. Now the primary links are titanium, satin finished. The intermediates are a sandwich of rose gold and then in between the rose gold you can see that blue gray tantalum. You can also see that the bezel itself has been comprised of this material. So the watch does have an impressive weight to it in spite of the fact that it is principally titanium. Now, the model references a chronograph made in the 90s that was similarly tritone and these three metals. What you won't see on that original is the no date dial. Whereas the standard diver 300 meter for 2018 featured a date, this is a lovely satin finished wave pattern titanium dial. It is made of titanium. It has a handsome matte finish over laser ablated waves. You can see that there are troughs and crests and it gives the dial a lively appearance with rose gold applique and rose gold James Bond style as they're known. Scale and hands. Throw the watch on the wrist, it wears easily. 13.7 millimeters thick, 42 millimeters in diameter, and 50 millimeters lug to lug with pivoted end links. It wears quite easily. The no date dial was exclusive to this model for 2018, and it is a very special piece. The timepiece, still 300 meters water resistant with the helium escape valve. It's been technically updated internally. As you can see, the watch features an all or nothing fold out dive extension, but a feature that was previously exclusive to the Planet Ocean and the Ploprof. You can see that push trigger. You are able to push and incrementally adjust in or out to size properly. All together you get almost two inches of extension or about 50 millimeters. The timepiece featuring internally a chronometer coaxial movement. You can see that this is caliber 8800. Let me show you the reverse side so you can see the balance better. Free sprung and full bridge for shock resistance. Silicon hairspring rendering it amagnetic, not anti-magnetic, amagnetic. 55 hour power reserve, a master chronometer which is the full watch standard that includes winding efficiency power reserve, chronometric precision, six position timing, and anti-magnetism. The watch includes the George Daniels envisioned tri-level coaxial, which is the latest and greatest iteration of the most exotic escapement you can buy for under $50,000, a very special piece. Now we're going to talk a little bit about another very special piece at a more accessible price point, but just as charming, this was probably the most interesting 2018 model, not called Seamaster Diver 300 meter. This is the Seamaster Railmaster Denim Blue with a lovely blue jeans inspired vertical strake multi-hued blue dial featuring quarter Arabics modeled after the vintage Railmaster reference of the 1950s, which I want to say was the CK2914. The watch is isn't the vintage Railmaster that debuted in 2017. This one is a little bit more contemporary in its appearance. A 40 millimeter case in satin stainless steel. It features a mechanically identical interior relative to the diver we just saw. So 55 hour power reserve, master chronometer, anti-magnetic, and the watch impressively 150 meters water resistant is a full service sports watch. Automatic winding, full steel, fully loomed, highly water resistant, and perfect for any range of wrist sizes from 13 centimeters circumference, yes, it is a unisex option, right up to the tree trunk forearm, because with the color and the character of this dial, the watch has an outsized presence. It doesn't need to be huge to have huge personality. Popping that one off the wrist real quick, we're going to take a look at something that debuted back in 2016 with the reboot of the Planet Ocean series. Now with the Planet Ocean series of 2016, we had new case sizes and new models. Now a master chronometer, this is the Planet Ocean Deep Black GMT, a GMT 45.5 millimeters in indelible scratch resistant ceramic. The watch features a matching matte ceramic dial, as you can see, it features 
triarabics in blue and a lovely subdued set of white and blue printing on the dial with a hybrid blue and black rotating dive style bezel. Let's hear the dive bezel. In fact, we're going to hear the dive bezel of both this and the diver. I will say that the Planet Ocean has a grittier, more mechanical feel, whereas the Diver 300 meter, the Tritone, it's chunkier. It feels as though the detents are bigger, even though they're both 120 click. Now jumping back real quick to the Planet Ocean, you do get a few extra features for your extra money. 600 meters water resistant helium escape valve, diving bezel. You have a second time zone. We're going to move everything out of the way so you can more easily see that blue second time hand, and it is a 24 hour hand. You can see there's a 24 hour scale inboard of the bezel. So you have true dual time capability. You also have more power reserve, courtesy of twin mainspring barrels. You have a 60 hour reserve, courtesy of the movement, which is the 8906. I'm gonna show it to you now. Pop that open, and you can see the twin mainspring barrels peeking up over the barrel bridge with the same spiral arabesque. A handsome movement with the arabesque spirals the Cote de Genève in unconventional form, along with blackened rather than blued screws. Good looking watch, it's substantial, but because it is short lug to lug, you're gonna see that the watch fits on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. And because it's comprised principally of sapphire and ceramic, it's also very light. A modern hardcore diving GMT for any adventure that might come to mind. It looks particularly striking against any skin tone, and I like the juxtaposition of my white sleeve and the black watch. It's a way to go with a black and blue Swiss sports watch that's not you know who. Speaking of which, you know who. This was probably the hottest watch of 2019 at the Rolex booth. I would dispute that perhaps because I'm a Yacht Master partisan, but this is the GMT Master II BLNR Generation 2, the successor to the 2014 Batman. This watch features a three-day power reserve, upgraded movement, 3285. It features, of course, the stainless steel case and matching Jubilee bracelet, an accessory that was originally offered on the GMT Master in the mid-50s, starting in late 1954 with the first examples delivered to Pan Am, but it was phased out with the arrival of the Super Case starting in 2005. And this is the return of the Jubilee to the GMT Master line. The watch still features the Easy Link internal to its clasp, 100 meter water resistance, and chromolite Rolex proprietary blue loom. The timepiece, of course, black and blue about its 24 hour GMT bezel, considerably thinner than the Omega you just saw. They do serve different purposes and play to different crowds. The historic Rolex dual time pilot's watch is able, in a pinch, to use its bi directional rotating ceramic capped black and blue bezel to calculate three different time zones. You have to set the 24 hour hand in varnished blue to Greenwich Mean Time, but then you can use the local port or GMT offset of your airport destination to read three times simultaneously. White gold hands, white gold indices, black lacquered dial, and the timepiece, of course, very slim in profile, only about 12.2, 12.3 millimeters thick, a very impressive timepiece. And I should mention that the Jubilee vents far better than the Oyster, so don't undersell its quality as a sports bracelet. That said, sometimes none but the Oyster will do. And for those who want perhaps a more versatile look, not as resolutely sporting, or perhaps not as extrovert as the black and blue, you have the model known as the Dark Rhodium Datejust 41. 126300 is the reference, 41 millimeters in stainless steel, full three link Oyster bracelet in outstanding condition. It's the dial of this one, a metallic silver gray sunburst with a dark rhodium coating, which is a darker version of the silver anti-corrosive placed on most Swiss brass movements. White gold indices fully loomed, 100 meters water resistant, and all around sports watch. It has a different character than the rotating bezel Rolex timepieces, and at under 12 millimeters thick, it's nice, flat, and flush on the wrist, easily sliding under any cuff. This one also has the three-day power reserve, courtesy of Rolex Manufacturer Movement 3235, with the Liga-etched Chronergy escapement that is Rolex's escapement alternative, or I should say, repost to the Omega coaxial. This is a timepiece that puts it all together. Very accurate, very tough, anti-magnetic, water resistant, and wearable on any, I would say, 14 centimeter circumference and up wrist with any attire. That said, if you want a splash of color, but you don't want to go with a mainstream Rolex model, you want something a little bit 
left or right of center, depending on your preference, this is probably the way to go. This is the Oyster Perpetual Yacht Master 116622 Blue Sunburst with white and red accents on the dial. The watch features a full platinum bi-directional yachtsman's bezel. You line up the index with the minute hand and now you have a timer that allows you to count up or down to the start of a match within a regatta or a sailboat race. The timepiece, flatter, thinner, and more elegant of profile than the Submariner. You can see this is not the super case. The super case, for reference, is what you see on the GMT. It has a sheer side. It has squared off lug profiles. It's anything but the graceful arc of a Daytona or a Datejust, whereas the Yachtmaster itself is much more like those two timepieces. As you can see, all of high polish with graceful tapered lugs, compound curvature on its case flank, anything but sheer and squared off. Throw the 40 millimeter watch on the wrist. I should mention it's 100 meters water resistant. Still powered by caliber 3135, 48 hour power reserve, tank tough, and a COSC chronometer. This is a watch that represents a different kind of rotating bezel Rolex sports watch. Richer, I would say a little bit more refined, a little bit more upscale. It's not the bare knuckle brawler of the Submariner. This one wears a velvet glove. This is a timepiece of extraordinary color and character, and probably my favorite current yacht master. It's absolutely neck and neck with the 42 white gold, which is a spectacular timepiece. Now let's jump to something entirely different. Let's talk about, well, let's talk about independent horology, and let's go big. In the world of Geneva watchmaking, Rolex, Patek Philippe, Vacheron, even F.P. Journe come to mind when you think luxury dress watch or luxury dress complication, but you should know the name and the work of Laurent Ferrier. Once a Patek Philippe complication specialist, he struck out in the late 2000s with his son Christian and a group of investors to start a brand under his own name. Also a racing enthusiast, he's come up with a number of ingenious mechanisms in gorgeous cases to match. This is the Galet Traveler. It is a dual time watch with an enamel dial, and as you can see, it is an extraordinary cloisonne enamel. From this angle, you can see the little cloison, or gold wires, that are used to create the outlines of the figures shown on this northern hemisphere dial. You can see that different colors, weights, thicknesses of enamel are used in and around the cloison in order to create the image of the land masses and the water, entirely handmade and excruciatingly slow and delicate. This is true handmade craft art. In a 41 millimeter white gold case, you can see the timepiece is intuitive. As you're able to move the hour hand using a travel time set of up, down, pusher adjusters on the case flank, there is a second time zone in 24 hour format over at nine o'clock, and the timepiece has that organic, smoothed pebble galet shape with a semi-onion style crown inspired by pocket watches. Turn it all over and you can see caliber 230 is a masterpiece. Double direct impulse escapement, free sprung, six position adjustment, a ratchet operating, jeweled pivot style, 22 karat guilloche cut winding mass for silent winding without rattle. All of it is immaculately finished with a three day power reserve. The refinements runneth over. Five interior angles, four inside the skeletonized half bridge for the balance, one over the center wheel. And as you can see, I'm gonna to try to show you, but from this angle, mirrored anglage, so fat you can see it without a loop. This is as good as it gets in the world of fine finish. And while Laurent Ferrier is open about using manufacturing and engineering partners to help supply its movements, most notably La Fabrique du Temps. The company's work is unarguably among the best in Switzerland and indeed the world. I would compare their finish favorably against not just Patek and Jorn, but Alango Unzona, my personal yardstick for greatness. This is an awesome watch. Now sticking with our theme of independence, I'm actually going to call out a friend, two friends actually, folks who have been good to me in the past. Edward Melon of H. Moser and C, CEO, and Mike Morgolis, their U.S. distributor. And this is the watch everyone was talking about late last year, the full integrated bracelet chronograph from H. Moser and C, the Streamliner. Inspired by the 70s, but not the Gerald Genta 70s design, the watch goes its own way. 42.3 millimeters in diameter, 14.2 millimeters thick, 120 meters water resistant. You can see it has a vertical satin grained dial with the fumé fade from silver gray at its center to black at its edge. Also note the stepped track for the chronograph, a racing style calibration like you'll see on vintage Speedmasters, and note that the 
Agengraf-based movement uses a central second and central 60 minute display. So you could see that the display of minutes is not only jumping, but it reads up to 60, whereas most chronographs only read up to 30. And being centrally located like my Zin EZM1, it is easier to read the minutes as they jump. There's a lovely style of hybrid hands, a handsome and spare use of red flourishes, and this lovely lapping machine style radial sunburst that emanates over the top of the case from an imaginary center point above the cannon pinion. Now as you can see, the watch features slightly scalloped sides because that is a Moser trademark, but note how exquisitely contoured the top of that case is. It flows into a integrated bracelet that's nothing like the Nautilus, the Royal Oak, or the IWC Jumbo Ingenieur. This is a little bit like the Omega Lobster Tail bracelets of the 70s. And if you were to look at this dial, you would say it evokes 70s motorsports chronographs without being derivative of anything in particular. It's a reincarnation of the spirit, not the style. The watch has style, but it's a style of its own. It's not designed to look like a particular reference from the past. It's also easy to wear as it's fairly flush and the bracelet is extremely flexible. The movement, which features over 440 parts and 55 jewels, uses a Ajin clutch, basically a hybrid of a vertical clutch as well as a lateral clutch to start the chronograph without any jump, but at the same time it also is able to give you the beauty and the visible vista of operating mechanisms that you see with a lateral clutch. So it's the best of a vertical clutch and a lateral clutch while operating off a column wheel mechanism. That's one of my favorite features. The the rotor on the watch, it's a little bit hard to explain. It's not a peripheral rotor, it's not a micro rotor, it's actually underneath the dial, winding the 54 hour power reserve. And again, the watch being 120 meters water resistant, it is a full service sports watch. I'm not a vendor of those. I'm doing this as a favor to a couple of friends because I love them and I love their brand. And during these times, independents need all the help they can get. That said, that one's on a firm footing. I do have a Moser you can buy, however. This is one of mine. This is the Pioneer Center Seconds Cosmic Green with the same Fume style, 42.8 millimeters in stainless steel and also 120 meters water resistant. This is a watch with an upscale dial and an unconventional sporting application of foy or leaf style hands. I mentioned that Moser uses scalloped case profiles as a design signature and you can see that well. There's an extraordinarily dome profile to the rather expensive sapphire employed. Again, Moser creating all of its own movements other than the one in the streamliner, which is provided by Agenor of Geneva. This is the HMC 200, which is a three-day automatic winder, in-house magic lever winding system, free sprung, stop seconds, very slick. And as you can see, Moser always in good taste, giving you an expressive dial without a date to keep it clean and symmetrical. An easy watch to wear and very comfortable. You can see how the lug profile helps it to wrap around the wrist. So though it's almost 43 millimeters, it wears more like a 40 or a 41. Very comfortable, versatile, and fun-loving. We need more green watches in the business, and I think Moser is on the right track with this particular Fume Fade. Absolutely nailed it. Speaking of green watches, I can't speak to the ecological sustainability of Panerai, but they got the color right. And this is an absolute gem. Released back in 2017 as part of Panerai's first three watch flight of non-bronzo green dials. This is the Panerai 736. It is a Rodimir 1953 days. And as you can see, 47 millimeters in polished stainless steel. The watch has a lovely military green dial with rose gold hands and ecru style simulated patina accents on a true bi-level two component sandwich dial, a stencil on top of a fully loomed disc, that is to say. The watch features a matching military green rubber strap with bellows, and as you can see on the underside, hollows to more easily vent the wrist on a hot day. You can see a variant of the Caliber 3000 is used, manual wind, twin barrel, free sprung with a full bridge for shock resistance, three day power reserve, and it features a slick function that makes it particularly suitable for travelers, as you're able to jump the hour independently without actually stopping the seconds hand, and the timepiece is able to jump time zones forward or back, 
even adjust the date, which you could see forward or backwards as you travel east or west. The timepiece is also robustly water resistant down to 100 meters, so it is a true Panerai sports watch, even as it gives you an option, as it would wear well with a suit being fairly formal, simple, and stripped down. It's huge, but that is the Panerai style. The 736 is a glorious thing and a standout among Panerai watches. If you like the Panerai history, heritage, and look, but you don't like the fact that they're a bit of a clone culture watch, this is the one for you, as it doesn't look like all the rest. Now, sticking with Panerai for a moment, we look back to hallowed antiquity, and turning back, we recall that right up until about 2005, some of the most aggressive Panerai divers actually continued to use tritium dials. And what we have here is a Panerai Luminor submersible 243, PAM 243, and this model is 44 millimeters in stainless steel with a real tritium fade dial. This is no Fotina here. This is the real deal. Tritium with a half-life of roughly 12 and a half years, long since having faded into this glorious ecru or cream coloration, it gives the watch immense charm. And again, this being the correct original dial, all of that tritium is intact. Panerai dive bezels are the best in the business. Some may equal, but none exceed. Let's hear this. So chunky, so mechanical, so visceral and sharp. It is the standard for bezel feel among divers. Now, of course, you've got the locking lever that unlocks this monstrous deep diver. And of course, 1,000 meters the depth, you lock just like that. You unlock the crown just like that, which means without screwing out the crown, I can wind it, I can set it, I can operate the quick set. All of this possible because during the late 40s, Panerai invented this system, which is both a more effective all aspect crown guard and a remarkable means of preserving the seals of the crown so you're not threading the stem in and out of the seals, rather. You're only decompressing and recompressing the seal. Inside, it's tank tough. It's a 7750 with the chronograph components removed and it's a COSC certified chronometer, so it's both tough and accurate. You'll also note the quick release system underneath the lugs on both sides. J-Series watch, mid-2000s, you can see those little buttons that you push to release the bars that retain the strap, so you can then push them through. Heck, you can remove the strap with two halves of a broken toothpick. You can push those bars through and swap the straps, because Panerai swap strapping is part of the Paneristi culture. And they make it easy to do without risking your talents with a strap tool or with a screwdriver. And I should also mention that this being a hardcore diver from Panerai, the 243 also includes a flush helium escape valve on the flank of its 1,000 meter water resistant case. You'll also note the beautifully sculpted Luminor 1950 case profile. This is not the tuna can Betterini case. Sticking with divers, but perhaps a little bit more spare of material and of form, more vintage inspired, and frankly, more colorful, last year's sensation, the Oris Divers 65 steel bronze. Blue dial, ecru loom, rose gold, coated applique indices and hands, and then a bronze insert inside the unidirectional rotating dive bezel. 100 meters water resistant. It is a 1965 dive watch homage with the characteristics of a vintage diver, including a very narrow mid case, minimally profiled lugs that are squared off without a bevel. You could see that the sapphire has a lovely vaulted domed profile to evoke the distortion of a plexiglass from the mid 60s. You'll also note the big crown style crown without a crown guard profile. Throw the watch on the wrist, it is very comfortable. A true diver powered by a Salita SW200 base that's just a tank tough tractor movement for a tank tough watch. You can see it has a lot of charm. Viable as a dress watch because of its spare size and detailing, it's also a true diver that you can use provided you do not need to avail yourself of greater than 100 meters of diving depth. I'm guessing even if you're a fairly committed Scuba diver, this is going to be more than enough for you. A handsome piece and one of the best from Oris and an affordable price point. All cool watches don't have to cost a mint, and that's an important lesson that I try to convey in every episode. Now, speaking of watches that I think would, will stand the test of time, obviously the Diver 65 has, but let's go back to 1939. 1965, meet 
late Art Deco and the IWC Portuguese are hand wound. I prefer to call it the Portuguese since I don't speak IWC's lingua franca, German, and I call this the Portuguese. It was inspired by the Portuguese importers of IWC during the 30s who wanted a wristwatch as accurate as a pocket watch. Thus, an oversized case was necessary in order to fit an IWC pocket watch movement. And at about 43 millimeters, this watch continues that trend as it does include an IWC pocket watch caliber. This is a 98,000 series IWC manual wind pocket watch caliber. I believe this is the 98290. Manual wind, 46 hour power reserve with a three quarter style bridge as you would have found in the pocket watch era, an immense diameter of approximately 37 millimeters to fill the case back. You have that Jones arrow style micrometric regulating index, jewels set in golden chaton as they would have been crafted in the pocket watch era. First the jewels would be placed in a precision chaton and then those would be pressed into the bridges because tolerances for machining the bridges were not as advanced in the 19th century. And then you have a giant balance which is almost one third the diameter of the movement, beating away at a pocket watch style 19,000, or excuse me, 18,000 vibrations per hour, adjusted in five positions with an overcoil hairspring made by hand, a very accurate, stately, handsome, and historically true movement. And this is about as good as it gets. What do we even call this dial? An inverse panda non-chrono? It's lovely. It's perfect. With the Arabic numerals characteristic of the original, the railroad track outboard of the numerals, small seconds at 6 o'clock, and leaf hands, this is very similar to the original reference 325 Portuguese of 1939. Throw it on the wrist. It's comfortable. It's broad. It's flat. The Portuguese was the original oversized wristwatch. And you can see it remains that to this day. Anything but a product of fad or fashion, it is true to its history, being large large and not necessarily bold for its own sake, but for the sake of an accurate pocket watch movement then and now the case. A full manufactured product from Schaffhausen, it wears beautifully on a wrist 15 centimeters circumference or larger. Now if you want something from the other great pillar of IWC history, a pilot's watch, I can't think of a better model than this 3713. 3713 double chronograph. Flieger, of course, a flyer's watch, an aviator. This is an interesting panda with a white lacquer dial, blue registers, applique numerals, and a German language calendar. You can see this one is a little bit evocative, not just the old 1990s style, a watch that was made from 1996 until 2005, but this particular 3713 has original tritium, so it is a true mid to late 1990s IWC double chronograph from the era just after Richard Hobring designed the first series production split second chronograph mechanism for Schaffhausen. The movement is effectively the company's own as they cut the movement, the 7750 in half, and insert an immense amount of original running gear to create the split seconds. They also replace the power source, the drivetrain, and the regulator, creating what was effectively an IWC in-house caliber, and I want to say it was the 79230, that was the name. But here's the thing, there is an element of exclusivity to not only is this an historic piece and gorgeous, but it was an individually numbered 130 piece limited edition, meaning unlike modern IWC, this is not one of 130. It is truly unique with an individual engraved number. Solid case back, of course, because there is a soft iron inner shield to protect the movement. Anti-magnetic, 60 meters water resistant with a screw down crown and thus swimmable on the surface. It's a handsome and versatile piece with an unusual combination of tritium fade, lacquer white dial, and blue sub-registers. Truly handsome with all the lettering and printing on the dial in a matching blue. This is old school IWC from before the Georges Kern era, and there is plenty Plenty to be said about that. If you want a modern collectible from Schaffhausen, most folks agree that it becomes slim pickings after about 2003-2004. That is a wonderful piece and a true vintage example being now over 20 years old. So let's talk a little bit about something that's anything but old. One might even say F.P. Journe of Geneva, though admittedly now 21 years old as of 2020 still feels fresh because there's a consistency about the design from the early days to the present that makes everything feel immune to planned obsolescence and this model part of the five piece ruthenium set of limited editions of 99 pieces is the Octa Calendrier Ruthenium. The watch is 40 millimeters which was uncommon back when these were made in 2000 
roughly 2001 to 2003. The watch that you see here does have a ruthenium coated dial. It has a ruthenium coated brass movement. So it is brass movement era FP Journe. Remember, after mid 2004, they went to the gold calibers, which though richer are also far, far, far more common. As a result, people search out these early brass movements, and with only 99 examples made of this annual calendar octa in ruthenium, it is a platinum 40 millimeter rarity among rarities. As F.P. Journe made far fewer then than its current 900 watches per year, but these were all scarce, built out over several years. It's not as though the 99s were built in a single season. You can also see that this one was built towards the end of the series, probably built in 2004, as the case itself has a 04 code, meaning it would have been made by Eleanor just outside Paris, F.P. Journe's original case constructor, in 2004 prior to the assembly of the watch. Now, the watch is an annual calendar, meaning it needs adjustment only once per year the jump from February to March. It features a retrograding date and all of the functions can be adjusted through the crown. So there are no adjuster dimples on the flank of the case. It is very clean, about 10 millimeters thick, with an automatic winding five-day chronometric power reserve, though in truth it will run for about seven. The Ruthenium series is highly sought, and along with all three of the Vagabondage, or for example, all five of the 2015 Steel 38s. Collecting the full Ruthenium series is a little bit of a Shangri-La quest for collectors of F.P. Journe, and this is one of the best early examples. The drama of the ruthenium dial, the robust 40 millimeter platinum case, the brass movement coated uniquely in ruthenium, and the 99 piece numbered series, very special and eminently desirable. It has a cool grayscale presence, techno-industrial chic on the wrist. If you want something different and slightly more colorful, then perhaps an F.P. Journe Resonance 3. The Resonance 1 was the original symmetrical dial with a brass movement. The Resonance 2 was the symmetrical dial with a rose gold movement. And towards the end of 2009, we got the Resonance 3 that you see right here, which makes a distinction between the 12 hour local time and then there is a scrolling set of 24 hours and minutes that comprises a reference time zone or a travel time zone. That's the time where you are not. So you can keep track of AM and PM. Now the watch also features a synchronization so that after about seven to 10 minutes when the resonance begins to mutually regulate the two balances, you can fly back the two seconds hands and synchronize them and they will stay synced thanks to the resonance phenomenon. You could see, and I'm gonna put the balances at the top right here, caliber 1499, all in rose gold and two balances, two mainspring barrels, two drivetrains, two escapements. They are not connected in any way, but the resonance phenomenon couples them the way pendulums and the way metronome in close proximity will synchronize to each other, the parasitic emanations from the escapements and the balances help to synchronize them and thus they mutually regulate. So if one runs fast, the other will slow it down and vice versa. That is why this watch is not just the resonance, but the chronomet resonance, a timepiece of exceptional precision with six position adjustment and the resonance phenomenon to compound its resistance to deviation. Truly special at 40 millimeters in platinum. This is the black label model, which is doubly exclusive. First, only sold through FP Journe boutiques and espace, and second, only sold to those who can prove previous purchase of a new F.P. Journe, and there is a strict limit on how many examples of each model, generally two, can be made each year. Very scarce, very rare, very special, and eminently usable as a dual time, possibly the most useful of complications. That's a very special piece right there. Handsome, fun, but not too much fun. If you want to have too much fun, you need the man who's not a watchmaker, but possibly the best marketer on the planet. You need Richard Mille. And the Richard Mille RM05 is a wearable tonneau case. The iconic form from the Frenchman, this is the RM005. 37.5 millimeters wide by 45 millimeters lug to lug with a cambered curved case. It's easy and comfortable to wear. On my small wrist, this model, which was new for 2004, gave Richard Mille his first basic three hand and date automatic, a way to get into the persona, the lifestyle, the imagery, and the technical sophistication of Mille without spending, well, let's say a mega yacht's worth on your watch. Now it's still very advanced as the timepiece features a couple of distinctions that I always like to shout out. The first of which, 
ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, is the titanium movement. Now, the titanium movement is based on a Valshe 4000, but the Valshe 4000 is not made of titanium. It also features an architecture with a rubber shock absorber at all four corners. So you get shock resistance. You also get variable inertia. As you can see, there are little winglets that move in and out to change the polar moment of the rotor and thus to make it a more active or less active winder depending on your needs. It can be set to wind as per the activity that you deem appropriate. You don't want to wear out the system. You're very active, you can reduce the sensitivity in the winding. If you're a desk warrior like me, maximize the polar moment and speed up the winding. You can also see the watch uses a free sprung balance. So along with the lightweight titanium, the shock absorbers, the free sprung balance is the third element that makes this a highly shock resistant watch. A very special piece. And I can never really get over the fact that these early RM5s are more water resistant as the early examples are rated to 100 meters and the later ones are rated to 50. So this one is rated to 100 meters and thus good to go for all aquatic fun. The timepiece, easy to wear on a wrist as small as 13 centimeters in circumference, is good to go regardless of your forearm size. You don't need a tree trunk forearm to go swimming with Richard Meal. Now, speaking of sports watches, some will wish to tone it down. And for those, you have the Vacheron Constantin overseas. Third generation, the black dial that debuted back in 2018. It's 41 millimeters in stainless steel. And this thing is the bee's knees. 150 meters water resistant, 25,000 ampere per meter anti-magnetic, a removable bracelet with a quick release lug system. It comes with two separate straps, one in rubber, one in leather. Geneva hallmark, manufacture movement, five position adjustment, hand engraved, three finishes on the rotor, and 60 hour power reserve. Truly special stuff, and as you can see, very slim. The bracelet is beautifully handmade, and every individual link, as you can see, is removable, so you will find the proper size. And if that doesn't get it done, the two built-in micro extensions will get the job done. A handsome watch, Geneva Hallmark in a no holes barred black dial steel sportster. Absolutely killer. That would be my choice of all of the sports watches on the table today, unless I can have the Streamliner. And I'm not sure I can because they only made 100 and I think they're sold out. But if you want a great standby and a rival of Vacheron, Patek Philippe and a Nautilus or an Aquanaut is often the way people go. With more history, heritage, and one might say pedigree than the Richard Meal, and a more patrician and some might say equity chock-a-block name, Patek Philippe gives you the refinement, the durability, and frankly, the no-nonsense functionality in the Aquanaut. The 5167A launched in 2007, 10 years after the original Aquanaut. It's a 40 millimeter watch, and as you can see on the wrist, it wears quite thin. Low in profile and identically powered compared to the Nautilus, at least until recently when the Nautilus gained the 26330. You can see the watch is broad, flat, and elegant. It wears as a dress watch, but the rubber strap gives it a dressed down youthful persona. Hugely loomed and easier to read than a Nautilus. It's a practical timepiece, and as you can see, sliding easily under a cuff. 120 meters is more than enough for me. The watch features a high degree of finishing on the caliber and the guarantee of running minus three plus two seconds a day from the factory. So it's both highly resilient and highly accurate. We're not quite done. We're not done until Patek Philippe says we are, and we're not quite there. This is a model that I once owned, a timepiece that frankly is absolutely crazy. Two movements inside one case like the resonance, but with a Foudreon chronograph and twin center seconds, one for the time, one for the chronograph, the 2010 200 piece 42 millimeter white gold dual met a chronograph is an outstanding innovation. Based on a pocket watch from the 1880s that used a Victor Ampiguet, a Bausch, the dual wing movement, which features two barrels and 50 hours times two as a power reserve, one barrel drives the chronograph, one barrel drives the time, and they have one regulator that acts as a traffic cop switching one on and one off and it beats away at six beats per second on off on off on off and thus the chronograph and the time beat away simultaneously it's also a mono pusher and as you can see resetting it is a wonderful piece of theater note the hours and the minutes on the mono counter up at two o'clock i release 
and everything resets. Of course, the movement is built like a pocket watch, which means it's built a little bit like a langa, with the same German silver material, it's known as Maichot in the French-speaking regions of Switzerland, nickel, copper, and zinc giving it that golden hue, and Cote de Soleil emanating out from an imaginary center point atop the balance, splaying out across the bridges. This is the highest degree of JLC finish, and you don't have to pay $100,000 to get it. Why? Because JLC recognized the Dual Met was a flagship and thus lavished its best finish on that model line, even though prices were generally about forty to fifty thousand dollars, rather than the customary JLC Ultra Haute de Gamme one hundred thousand. This was launched for two thousand nineteen. We're flipping to the opposite side of the world. This is the Grand Seiko Elegance Series SBGK 4 one hundred and fifty pieces. 39 millimeters in rose gold with a black lacquer dial. It is extraordinary. And it uses a Arushi lacquer dial and then a technique called Takamaki E, which actually re results in the buildup of silver powder that is then painted over the indices themselves to create a three dimensional form. And the indices do have loft and volume and height above the dial. And the same treatment is lavished on the Grand Seiko logo as well as the numerals, which are actually painted with a rose gold powder paint. Very special, a handcrafted dial, a handmade case with all polishing black polish by Grand Seiko's spinning tin plate manual skill Zeratsu polishing technique. And and the 9S63, the first all new manual wand Grand Seiko caliber in eight years with a 72 hour three day power reserve and six position adjustment. This is a technically and aesthetically impressive slim profile 150 piece limited edition manufacturer movement dress watch handmade inside and out. This is a viable alternative to the likes of your Piaget, your Giger Le Cult, your Blancpain. Truly special, handsome, and rare. It's also evidence of how Seiko and Grand Seiko do things with their own style, flair, and sensibility. It's not meant to be a Japanese version of a Swiss watch. It is proudly a Japanese product. And by the way, the leather on those watches, I don't know how they do it, but it is buttery soft right out of the box. Let's see what we've got left. I always miss something interesting, and I don't want to this time because my goodness, do we have a finish in store. 38 millimeters. Oh, I want to keep this watch. 38 millimeters in platinum. This is the 2005 Basel World launch Patek Philippe 5078P001 with a Grand Faux enamel dial, three hands, a minute repeater, and a no nonsense high horology micro rotor automatic caliber R27. This is as good as it gets. Discreet, downright inconspicuous moderately sized and beautifully made. The case uses welded lug construction. The dial is solid gold with vitreous enamel fired up to 20 times at 800 degrees centigrade to create the hand-painted vitreous enamel dial. And then of course, you have the highest standard of Patek Philippe finish on that R27 movement. And as you can see, it is gloriously wrought. Handsome, lustrous, detailed, millimetrically precise, right down to the micrometer level. Throw it under a 12, 20 power loop. You name your poison. It can hold up. And it doesn't need me to sing its praises because this minute repeater can speak for itself. Let me see if I can keep my record of setting 1259 precisely intact. I was so close. If ever a watch demanded a pause and a second pass, it's this one right here. Sing to me, baby. I keep missing the mark, but you know what? Let me show you what the watch looks like in action. Black polished strikers. I'm going to set this one 
a little bit more conservatively so I can get every strike. Black polished strikers, a hidden centrifugal governor. So it's not just that the watch is musical and lyrical, it's also well paced. My millimetric setting skills need some work these days. I've been laid off from a minute repeater for too long. I should have one on every episode. No big breaks between watches of that kind of sonorous quality. Guys, thank you so much. Email tmaso at thewatchbox.com to own anything you see here. Me and my team are standing by. That's the direct line from you to me and my handpicked crew. Thanks to Garrett, thanks to Sean, and thanks to you for the best job in the world. Time out, Tim out. Thanks for logging on.